Sherry Bates was an 18-year-old college freshman in her hometown of Riverside, California. But on Halloween morning in 1966, Sherry's body was discovered on the grounds of her own campus. Sherry's car had been sabotaged and her throat had been cut, but Sherry's killer somehow vanished and the police were baffled. Case number 352-481 quickly went cold. Then, a month after Sherry's murder, someone had typed and mailed a letter confessing to the crime. Was this confession the big break police desperately needed, or was it some kind of a bad joke? The anonymous confession letter was specifically intended for the Riverside Chief of Police, with an exact copy also sent to the local newspaper. At that time, the Chief of Police in Riverside was an experienced lawman named Kincaid. The unknown author wanted their confession to the police chief to be published in the newspaper for all to read. But Kincaid knew the confession could be a hoax, so he searched for proof that the author of the confession letter was truly Sherry's killer. As police chief, Kincaid had direct access to the evidence room that held the many clues collected by his detectives pertaining to the murder of Sherry Bates. And after reviewing that evidence and Kincaid's expert opinion, there was no doubt the author of the confession letter was also the killer of Sherry Bates. This is from Kincaid's October 20, 1969 letter to the sheriff of Napa County, California, Earl Randall. Quote, There is no doubt that the person who typed the confession letter is our homicide suspect. Unquote. Kincaid's letter to Sheriff Randall had been prompted by California's notorious Zodiac Killer, an apparently random killer on the other side of California who had recently struck again. This time, the Zodiac had surfaced at Lake Berryessa, a lake located in Sheriff Randall's jurisdiction. The Zodiac Killer's attack at the lake resulted in the death of a 22-year-old college student named Cecilia Shepard. Police Chief Kincaid had noticed many similarities between the Zodiac's 1969 attack at the lake and Kincaid's own 1966 unsolved homicide of Sherry Bates. In both cases, the killer had used a knife, and in both cases, the killer had actually called the police to report his own crime. However, what interested Kincaid the most is at the time of their murders, both Sherry and Cecilia were attending college in Riverside, California. Coincidence, or could Sherry Bates have been murdered by a serial killer who had since moved to a different part of the state? And to make matters even more urgent, the Zodiac was now threatening to target and kill schoolchildren, and Police Chief Kincaid knew that if the Zodiac killer had also been the murderer of Sherry Bates, Kincaid's own evidence room might hold the key to stopping the Zodiac once and for all. This original podcast is based on official police documentation and my exclusive interviews with law enforcement officials, as well as my interviews with the friends and family members of the victims. This podcast is also based on verified tips provided to me by the public going back 25 years and based as well on my own unique research discoveries. Make sure and check below this podcast video for links to the full Bates Confession Letter, plus additional content you won't want to miss. About 15 years after the murder of Sherry Bates, history was rewritten. And today, in popular culture, the Zodiac Killer's link to the Sherry Bates murder is often portrayed as being nothing more than a theory of an enterprising newspaper reporter, a reporter famously portrayed in film by actor Robert Downey Jr. But the truth, as you will learn, is quite the opposite. I've gone back to the beginning, 1966, and put everything in its proper context. And as a result, at my website, ZodiacKiller.com, Sherry Bates is now finally rightfully listed as being a definite victim of the Zodiac Killer. What began in Riverside finally ended at Lake Berryessa, just as predicted by the author of the Bates Confession Letter, a letter that would prove to be as much of a curse as a confession. The tragic and unsolved killings of Sherry and Cecilia in my murder basement. Thank you.
March of 1910, Curly Kincaid was born on a farm in Oklahoma. As a child, Kincaid's older brother had given him the nickname of Curly, a nickname Kincaid grew to prefer over his real name, Lambert. Kincaid's natural ambition eventually led him away from the family farm, and in 1932, after graduating from Oklahoma State University with a degree in animal husbandry, the 25-year-old Kincaid found his way to Riverside, California, and took a job caring for horses. But it didn't pay too well, so Curly Kincaid successfully applied for a job as a police officer. His career in Riverside law enforcement began in 1938, and by 1965, Curly Kincaid had advanced to become police chief. And Curly was no pushover. The tough-talking chief was often the subject of controversy, as Kincaid sometimes used politically incorrect language to make it clear that crime and criminals had no place in his community. Just a year after joining the police force, Curly had married a woman named Zelda Zink. And by the mid-1960s, both Curly and Zelda were well-known figures in the quiet community of Riverside. On the warm evening before Halloween, it was already dark when Sherry Bates's college library opened at 6 p.m., as the time change had occurred early that morning. An aspiring airline stewardess, Sherry needed at least two years of college before she could fly the friendly skies. So for the time being, she worked part-time at a local bank and took classes at Riverside City College. Sherry had driven to her campus library to check out a few books she needed for a class assignment, and Police Chief Kincaid theorized that while Sherry was in the library shortly after it opened, her eventual killer tampered with her Volkswagen Beetle so that it wouldn't start, at which point when Sherry returned to the car with her library books, she either left willingly with the unknown subject or was somehow forced before eventually being killed in a nearby alley. Curiously, when Sherry departed her car for the very last time, even though it was dark outside, she left her car unlocked. Her windows rolled down, and the library books she had just checked out were left on the passenger seat. She had also left her car key in the ignition, which was odd, because Sherry had no idea her car had been disabled. For all Sherry knew, the next time she turned that key, her car would start as usual, and leaving her car unlocked with the key in the ignition could have allowed her precious VW Beetle that she was so proud of to be stolen. Also, if Sherry was like most other people on the planet, she would have kept her car key together with her house key, attached on the same keychain. So the question is, if Sherry had gone by choice with her eventual killer, why would she leave behind her keys? The library was scheduled to be open until nine o'clock that night, and while nobody knows for sure, I believe that while Sherry was trapped in her disabled car, her killer approached quickly, displayed a gun, and demanded that she go to his nearby vehicle. All conjecture aside, Sherry's killer did not take her directly to that dark alley where she was eventually attacked. Based on the timeline of events as established by Riverside investigators, Sherry Bates had already departed the library and was experiencing car trouble by 6.15 that evening. 6.15 p.m. was estimated to be the beginning of her ordeal. But according to the autopsy report that I obtained, Sherry wasn't dead until three to six hours after she left the library. What in the hell did her killer do with Sherry Bates for up to six hours before finally cutting her throat, killing her almost instantly? Sherry was left dead in a dark alley not far from her Volkswagen, face down in the dirt. That's bad enough, but based on the police timeline and autopsy report, the possibility exists that someone intended to keep Sherry captive long enough to kill her after midnight and the official start of Halloween. Which makes me wonder if Sherry Bates had been used as some kind of a bizarre sacrifice. What I know for sure is that just hours later, when most people were having fun celebrating Halloween, Sherry's parents, Joseph and Irene, her brother Michael, and her fiancé Dennis, were all trying to figure out how to deal with the brutal murder of a loved one. At the time of Police Chief Kincaid's letter to Sheriff Randall mentioned earlier in this podcast, police in the entire Bay Area of San Francisco were very busy. It was late October 1969, and throughout the San Francisco Bay Area, the many crimes of the Zodiac Killer had the police simply overwhelmed with investigative work, so much so that it took just over a full year for Bay Area Zodiac detectives 
to travel south to Riverside and meet with those detectives handling Riverside's first ever unsolved homicide, the murder of Sherry Bates. But once in Riverside on November 18, 1970, each police jurisdiction involved in that task force exchanged evidence and other information and jointly reached the same conclusion that Sherry Bates was definitely a victim of the Zodiac Killer murdered in Riverside, California more than two years before what was thought to be the Zodiac's first attack. The Riverside Task Force meeting was prompted by a handwriting match made just two days earlier by expert document examiner Sherwood Morrill. The Zodiac Killer was known to mail handwritten letters confessing to his own crimes, and nobody was more familiar with the Zodiac's unique handwriting than Sherwood Morrill. Curiously, five months after the typewritten Bates confession letters were sent, someone had also anonymously mailed handwritten letters taking credit for the Sherry Bates killing and promising more victims. And after intense scrutiny, it was concluded by Sherwood Morrill that those handwritten Bates letters had definitely been written by the man who is now known as the Zodiac Killer. From that point forward, the California State Department of Justice kept the entire task force updated on the progress made by each police jurisdiction involved in the hunt. With the Zodiac Killer's crimes now spanning all of California, the State Department of Justice created a top-secret report titled Zodiac Homicides. The report contained information about the confirmed Zodiac cases and was distributed to police departments throughout California. And that report included case number 352-481. The Sherry Bates murder now officially fell under the umbrella of the confirmed Zodiac crimes. But long before the task force found actual evidence linking the Zodiac and Sherry Bates cases, and before Sherwood Morrill confirmed the handwriting match, Police Chief Kincaid had already spotted his killer on the other side of California, now calling himself the Zodiac. With its confirmed link to the Zodiac killer having just been established, the city of Riverside was now on edge. The murder of Sherry Bates was bad enough but the idea of the notorious Zodiac Killer being so close to home was downright terrifying. The man who called himself the Zodiac was straight out of a scary movie, an evil criminal genius who not only committed multiple murders, sometimes while wearing a horrifying costume, but who also reported his own killings by calling the police and offering detailed confessions to those crimes in many handwritten letters to authorities, taunting letters that included his personal symbol, a circle over a cross, resembling a gun sight. And in those letters, he challenged the police to catch him. In some cases, the Zodiac's letters contained actual physical evidence, such as a bloody scrap of a victim's shirt. The Zodiac even went so far as threatening to use a bomb to blow up full elementary school buses. And occasionally, the Zodiac killer sent secret coded messages, most of which have not been solved to this day. Those coded messages the Zodiac created are called ciphers. In a cipher, to create your secret message, you substitute letters of the alphabet with symbols of your own choosing. When a cipher from the Zodiac was received, to read his secret message, it was necessary to figure out which symbol of the cipher represented which letter of the alphabet. Of the four ciphers the Zodiac Killer provided the world, only one was conclusively solved, and the secret message it contained began with, quote, I like killing people because it is so much fun, unquote. That secret message went on to explain that to the Zodiac, everyone he killed would become his slave. The Zodiac was like the Joker from the Batman movies, but in reality, there were no superheroes to save California, just normal, everyday detectives who had never before seen anything like the Zodiac Killer. Behind the scenes, within the Riverside Police, there was no doubt Zodiac was their man, having killed in Riverside before inventing the Zodiac persona. However, in interviews with the local media, officials from the Riverside Police Department portrayed skepticism, assuring the public that Zodiac might have simply lied when he took credit for the Sherry Bates murder. By acting skeptical, the Riverside Police were actually emulating a strategy used earlier by Bay Area detectives. Back in July 1969, when the Zodiac Killer first began collecting his slaves in the San Francisco Bay Area, 
His attacks were followed by letters confessing to his crimes. Law enforcement officials knew the more letters they received from the Zodiac, the more evidence they would have to possibly catch him. So the police went public, saying they weren't convinced the letter writer was actually their killer. It was a strategy that resulted in the Zodiac killer sending additional letters and providing additional proof that he really was their man. And that ploy of skepticism eventually paid off again, this time for Riverside Police, as the Zodiac soon wrote a letter to the nearby Los Angeles Times newspaper, a letter acknowledging his murder of Sherry Bates in Riverside and claiming that he had taken even more victims in that area of California. And maybe the Zodiac Killer was telling the truth, because on the night of November 22, 1966, just a few weeks after Sherry Bates was killed, another young Riverside woman was walking on her college campus, heading to the library, when a stocky white man pulled up in his car and offered her a ride. The incident began at almost the exact time of evening as the Sherry Bates encounter the previous month, and the driver of the car even made reference to Sherry, saying, You heard about that girl at City College, right? When the young woman still refused a ride, the man said, I'm not Jack the Ripper. The encounter escalated into a kidnapping and assault situation. The young woman eventually escaped the car. The driver got away, and according to Riverside Police, that driver might also have been the killer of Sherry Bates. Allow me to briefly jump ahead. In the 1980s, there was a massive change within the Riverside Police Department, a change that saw the department entirely abandon the Zodiac killed Sherry Bates conclusion and replace it with the theory that Sherry had been killed by someone from her graduating class in high school. That massive departmental change was the direct result of Detective Bud Kelly taking over the Bates investigation. At the time Sherry Bates was murdered, Bud Kelly was a Riverside patrolman, not a detective and Bud Kelly played no meaningful part in the original murder investigation. Eventually, in the early 1980s, after becoming a detective and inheriting the Sherry Bates case, Bud Kelly became fixated on the suspect I'll refer to as Bob Barnett. Barnett and Sherry had attended high school together at Ramona High, and Barnett was just one of many male students who got a close, hard look by police, only to be ruled out as Sherry's killer. Sadly, by the time Bud Kelly took over the Sherry Bates case, Police Chief Kincaid and the other original investigators had retired. There was nobody to pull the reins in on Bud Kelly, who used the Sherry Bates case to suit his own agenda. Meanwhile, on the other side of California, a cartoonist for a San Francisco newspaper was writing a book about the Zodiac Killer, and his book preparation occurred during the very time that Bud Kelly was telling everyone who would listen that Zodiac had definitely not been the killer of Sherry Bates. Unfortunately, Bud Kelly influenced the cartoonist, and when the book was finally published, Sherry Bates was not included as an established victim of the Zodiac Killer. Over time, the case that Bud Kelly had built against Bob Barnett as being the killer of Sherry Bates was rejected by Riverside prosecutors on at least two occasions, and eventually DNA testing cleared Bob Barnett. But still, Bud Kelly's unprofessional bias succeeded in influencing younger Riverside detectives, convincing them that Bob Barnett was the killer case closed and it wasn't long before Bud Kelly retired and one of those younger detectives took over the Sherry Bates case. By the year 2000, it was Detective Steve Shumway who was in charge of the unsolved Sherry Bates homicide. Shumway was very familiar with my website, ZodiacKiller.com, and I had many detailed conversations with Detective Shumway. During one of those conversations, in May of 2000, Shumway dropped a bombshell directly on my head. Sherry Bates, he told me, had been stabbed 42 times. Every report I'd ever read indicated Sherry had suffered far fewer than 42 stab wounds, but Shumway was adamant. He told me, Tom, Sherry Bates was stabbed 42 times, and you can quote me. On May 4, 2000, I published that quote at ZodiacCure.com, and the result was tremendous controversy. Detective Shumway's claim of 42 stab wounds greatly contradicted Sherry's autopsy report that I had just recently acquired, and Shumway suddenly became strangely silent, offering no explanation for the vast discrepancy between his claim and what Sherry's autopsy report clearly showed. I was left with no choice but to conclude the Riverside detective now in charge of the Sherry Bates case 
hadn't even read her autopsy report. On TV, cold case detectives always start fresh, from scratch. They consult the murder book and look under every rock for clues missed by the previous detectives. But all too often, in reality, all those detectives know about their own cold case is misinformation they read on the Internet. As for Bud Kelly, in the year 2011, Kelly pled guilty to nine felony counts of child molestation and was sentenced to 24 years in prison. Bud Kelly is now 82 years old and will likely die behind bars. Meanwhile, Kelly's pet suspect, the man I referred to as Bob Barnett, recently retired to the Big Island of Hawaii. In the 1960s, Sherry Bates' family had next-door neighbors that included a 13-year-old girl named Susan. From Susan's bedroom window, she had a clear view of the Bates' kitchen window. And what Susan remembers most is how Joseph Bates, the dad, would make silly faces at her while he was doing the dishes next door. Joseph was born in New York, and when he bought the Riverside home back in 1951, he still had that Brooklyn accent. It was once a full house, occupied by Sherry, her brother Michael, and their parents, Joseph and Irene. The address? 4195 via San Jose. The Bates family occupied the home in some capacity for the next 21 years until Joseph finally sold it in 1972. Thirty years later, in 2002, I was invited inside that home where Sherry Bates had once lived. Sherry's old bedroom was tiny, and I couldn't help but notice how easy it would have been for someone to spy on her, perhaps from busy California Avenue, which was just yards away from her bedroom window. In doing so, that someone could have become very familiar with Sherry's entire family. Maybe that's why the Zodiac Killer eventually wrote one of them a letter. On April 30th, 1967, exactly six months after Sherry Bates was murdered, the Zodiac Killer sent a letter to Sherry's father, Joseph. To Joseph Bates, the Zodiac wrote, She had to die. There will be more. And sadly, the Zodiac's promise quickly came true when Sherry Bates' mother, Irene, was poisoned with strychnine. Her death was eventually ruled a suicide, but within several months of the poisoning death of Irene Bates, the Zodiac killer wrote another letter, this time claiming that he would disguise his murders, making them appear to be anything but murder. And soon after, the Bates' mother and daughter were joined in death by Sherry's grandmother. Within just three years, daughter, mother, and grandmother, all dead. And ironically, Sherry's grandmother was named Cecilia. As for Sherry's father, Joseph, following the murder of his only daughter, Joseph Bates patiently waited for justice that was never served. And in the year 2016, fifty long years after losing his daughter Sherry, Joseph Bates finally died at a care facility in New Mexico. He was 96 years old. In November of 1970, investigators concluded that it was the Zodiac who had killed Sherry Bates, and a month after killing her, in the Bates confession letter, the Zodiac had warned the chief of police that he was now stalking those very Riverside girls that Police Chief Kincaid had sworn to protect. And if line six of the confession letter was to be believed, on one of those Riverside girls, the Zodiac killer was again going to use a knife. And that is exactly what happened. When Sherry Bates was found dead at Riverside City College on Halloween 1966, Cecilia Ann Shepard was a 19-year-old sophomore at nearby La Sierra University, also in Riverside, and not far from the spot where Sherry was murdered. Cecilia was a full-time student who lived on campus. And during that same 1966-1967 school year, when Sherry was murdered, Cecilia had a college roommate named Sue, who took a night course at Riverside City College, and according to Sue, on at least two occasions, Cecilia went with her. And while Sue was in her class at night, Cecilia would study in that same small Riverside City College library where Sherry Bates had last been seen alive. The main route between the two colleges was Magnolia Avenue, and right on Magnolia was the only mental hospital in all of Riverside County, which brings to mind the confession letter 
that took credit for the murder of Sherry Bates and had warned, I am not sick, I am insane. According to Riverside newspaper reporter John Montgomery, at some point soon after Sherry's murder, a local mental patient told his psychotherapist that he believed he had killed Sherry Bates. And in late 1969, before anyone knew anything about a possible Zodiac connection to the city of Riverside, at that mental hospital on Magnolia Avenue, someone left a note claiming to be from the Zodiac Killer and threatening to burn down the entire hospital. Unfortunately, due to privacy laws, the identity of that mental patient will never be revealed. The unsolved murder of Sherry Bates lived inside Police Chief Kincaid, even after he finally retired in 1972. But as fate would have it, Curly Kincaid only had a few years to enjoy his retirement. Because, unfortunately, tragic deaths and mysterious coincidences did not just affect the Bates family. The curse of the confession also reached Police Chief Kincaid. For, on November 29, 1976, the exact ten-year anniversary to the day of when he first received his Bates confession letter, Lambert Thomas Kincaid, Jr., suddenly died in Long Beach, California. He was buried near Sherry Bates at Crestlawn Memorial Park in Riverside. Curly was just 66 years old. It was Friday, September 26, 1969, and 22-year-old Cecilia Ann Shepard had just recently begun another year of college. Already a graduate of La Sierra University, as well as Pacific Union College, or PUC, Cecilia was now a fifth-year music major at UC Riverside in Riverside, California. It was a busy Friday morning, as Cecilia and her friend Dolora were leaving on a road trip, a long drive north from the Riverside area, to spend a couple of days back in the Bay Area of San Francisco, where Cecilia had graduated college a few months earlier. The plan was to retrieve the last of Cecilia's belongings from her alma mater, PUC, which was not far from Lake Berryessa, and then to return to the Riverside area for good on Sunday, September 28th. But Cecilia never made it back home. Carolyn Shepard, Cecilia's sister, told me the morning Cecilia departed for the San Francisco Bay Area, she mentioned that when she ever died, she wanted to be buried at the cemetery in a small town called St. Helena, which was very close to PUC. And that same morning, while saying her goodbyes, Cecilia ran back to her mother, Wilma, and hugged her for a second time. According to Wilma, Cecilia had never done that before. Carolyn Shepard believed that Cecilia somehow knew her own death was coming soon. Cecilia was looking forward to seeing her former steady boyfriend, Brian Hartnell. The two had dated off and on for several years, and things were once again getting serious. In fact, Cecilia had recently confided to her sisters that she expected Brian to soon propose marriage. Leaving the Riverside area, Cecilia and Dolora took turns driving north, and by the next morning, Cecilia and Brian were finally back together once again. It was Saturday, September 27th. In the far corner of the PUC parking lot, a couple of freshmen, Carol and Holly, saw Cecilia and Brian together by Brian's car. The foursome knew each other. In fact, Carol was dating one of Brian's previous college roommates. In the parking lot, Brian was having trouble with his Volkswagen and was working inside the engine compartment. Carol asked Brian if she could be of some help, but Brian seemed confident he could solve the problem, so Carol and Holly went on their way. Amazingly, just as in Riverside nearly three years earlier, we again have a Volkswagen experiencing mechanical difficulties on a college campus shortly before a deadly knife attack that Zodiac would take credit for. But that's not all. According to Cecilia's good friend Lori, that same morning, in that same parking lot, the car that Cecilia had driven north in with Delora had issues with its battery, and Brian had to go to great lengths to get it to run. The day Cecilia was attacked, both cars associated with her had mechanical issues. Did someone tamper with those vehicles? perhaps as he did with Sherry Bates's Volkswagen Beetle back in Riverside? Unfortunately, Brian's car eventually started, and he and Cecilia went on their way. And at Lake Berryessa, later that day, after completing his knife attack 
the Zodiac Killer targeted Cecilia's passenger door to leave his symbol. Somehow, Brian Hartnell survived the attack. But just as the Bates confession letter had promised three years earlier, another Riverside girl had been murdered. And just as promised, it was with a knife. About a week later, Cecilia Shepard was buried at that cemetery in St. Helena. And right around the time the Zodiac finally admitted to killing Sherry Bates, someone went to Cecilia Shepard's former church near Riverside and signed the name Zodiac in the guest book. Though he was also attacked by the Zodiac killer, Hartnell was able to answer questions from detectives. According to Brian, he and Cecilia were on a picnic blanket, alone near the shore at the isolated lake, when Cecilia saw a stranger approaching them. When Brian finally got a look at him, the strange man was wearing a bizarre costume. Artistic recreations of that costume resembled an executioner's hood with a butcher's apron. On the chest area of the black costume, a circle over a cross. The man in the costume was holding a gun and claimed to be an escaped convict who needed to steal Brian's car in order to reach Mexico. The man with the gun had brought with him bindings, and he demanded that Brian and Cecilia be tied up. To Brian, the voice of the Zodiac Killer definitely made an impact. Here is an actual quote from Brian Hartnell's hospital interview with police a day after the attack and discussing the voice of the man behind the mask. Quote, His voice I can remember almost like I'd heard it before. Unquote. You can read the entire interview at my website, ZodiacKiller.com. But the fact that Zodiac's voice actually seemed familiar to victim Brian Hartnell is perhaps the most significant and overlooked detail in the entire Zodiac case, especially from the perspective that Cecilia Shepard had been targeted just like Sherry Bates. Brian and Cecilia had known each other for years, and at times they were much more than just friends. Could the Zodiac Killer's seemingly familiar voice have been the result of his lurking somewhere on the fringe of Cecilia's life and therefore somewhat familiar to Brian? From that hospital interview, here's what Brian Hartnell said about the demeanor of the Zodiac Killer, specifically when the Zodiac touched Cecilia Shepard. Zodiac became, quote, very, very nervous. His hands were shaking, unquote. When the Zodiac Killer was done stabbing, believing both victims were dead, the Zodiac simply walked away. But before leaving the lake area, Zodiac wrote his symbol on the passenger door of Brian's Volkswagen. Seventy minutes later, the Zodiac Killer called the Napa Police Department and spoke to Officer David Slate. Zodiac's voice was so quiet that Slate described it as barely audible. First, Zodiac was shaking. Then he was barely audible. A far cry from the confident and taunting killer who spoke over the phone to police dispatcher Nancy Slover following a gun attack just a few months earlier. And in that Napa phone call to Officer Slate, Zodiac seemed to make it clear that his focus had been on just one of those lake victims. The Zodiac actually had to correct himself, first reporting just one murder at the lake before remembering there had actually been two victims. Cecilia Shepard had already chosen the place where she would be buried. And by going to Lake Berryessa that day, Cecilia also chose the place that killed her. The parallels between the Zodiac Killer's Riverside and Lake Berryessa attacks are quite numerous. In Riverside, Sherry Bates had been lying face down on the ground when the Zodiac delivered the death blow with his knife. And later, at Lake Berryessa, Face down on the ground is how the Zodiac positioned Cecilia and Brian immediately before stabbing them with his knife. Also, in both the Bates murder and the attack at Lake Berryessa, the killer had involvement with the vehicles of his victims. In Riverside, Sherry's Volkswagen Beetle had been disabled by her killer, and at Lake Berryessa, the attacker wrote his symbol on a car door of Brian's Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Sherry and Cecilia were both Riverside College students when murdered and both were killed with a knife in early fall. In both attacks, the killer telephoned the police. But after so many similarities, there is one noticeable difference between Riverside and Lake Berryessa. In November 1966, the Zodiac mailed his confession to killing Sherry Bates. But no such confession was ever received in the murder of Cecilia Shepard. Or was it? <laughs> 
It's now the 50th anniversary of the Zodiac Killer's attack at Lake Berryessa. Many feel the Zodiac forever got away with murder, but I don't believe Police Chief Kincaid would have ever given up hope. Even more than 50 years ago, law enforcement officials knew the more letters they received from the Zodiac, the more evidence they would have to possibly catch him. And the Zodiac Killer's confession to murdering Cecilia Shepard has to exist somewhere. And with today's forensic technology, that missing Shepard confession just might end the curse forever. But where is the Zodiac Killer's confession to murdering Cecilia Shepard? Sherry Bates's killer made his confession in November of 1966. Perhaps Cecilia Shepard's killer did the same in November 1969. A confession contained in the unsolved Zodiac cipher that's known as the Z340. The Zodiac killer's need to take explicit credit for his murders by confessing in writing was his criminal signature, and that signature would have also surfaced after the Lake Berryessa attack. But in my opinion, the murder of Cecilia Shepard was so personal that the Zodiac killer wasn't going to make it easy for us. So the Zodiac put his Cecilia Shepard confession into the form of a cipher locked inside the Z340, a cipher so named because it contained 340 characters. But are there clues indicating this theory might actually be correct? In the November 1966 Bates confession letter, in reference to his female victim, the Zodiac killer used the word her a total of 18 times, and the Z340 cipher begins with the letters H-E-R. Zodiac chose to build the Z340 cipher so that it was exactly 17 characters wide and exactly 17 characters tall, and there are exactly 17 characters in the name Cecilia Ann Shepard. And amazingly, the day after the Z340 cipher was mailed, the Zodiac announced that he was finished confessing to his murders. A link to the Z340 cipher is below this podcast video. Maybe someone out there can finally crack the Zodiac's secret code and reveal the hidden message that could finally identify the Zodiac killer. I don't know if Sherry Bates was the first girl ever murdered by the Zodiac Killer, but all evidence indicates that Cecilia Shepard was the last, and I believe it was because the Zodiac's Riverside prophecy was finally fulfilled at Lake Berryessa, just as he promised three years earlier in that cursed Bates confession letter. Mm -hmm.